My dear son Harold, in close you'll find an outline of some of my life's doings as you requested. I have never kept any records of the things as they came and have tried to point out some of the things and trails I have been on. Hope you find something worthwhile in them. Your loving father, William E. Potts. Like Nephi of old, I can say I was born of goodly parents. At an early age I was taught lessons that will never pass away. My grandparents on my father's side were Thomas Potts and Harriet Pullen, both of English descent. Nine children were born to them. With my father Thomas Pullen Potts, born in 1839 in Boughton, Kent County, England, being the eighth child. Father's mother died when he was five years old. I was always told that grandfather was a veterinary surgeon, but census records show him to have been a butcher. All grew up as members of the Church of England. In town one day, my Aunt Alice, a young girl at the time, happened to hear the sweet singing of missionaries. Intrigued, she stayed to hear the preaching of the gospel by the Latter-day Saints, which made a great impression upon her. In 1849, at the age of 20, my Aunt Harriet Potts was the first to be baptized. Grandfather Potts didn't ever join the church, but between 1849 and 1857, Alice and all of his living children except Alfred chose to enter the waters of baptism and eventually came to America. My father was 12 years of age when he was baptized on April 4, 1852. My mother, Julia Jane Jemmett, also became a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints when she was 11. My mother's mother, Mary Ann Browning, was a widow with eight children when my grandfather, William Jemmett, married her. Her first marriage was to Nicholas Mears. My brother George has done some work for this line in the temple. Grandfather Jemmett, was blown up transporting gunpowder on a boat that he owned. I have his LDS hymn book in which his name was written in 1865. His temple work has been done. Grandmother came to America, lived with us and died in Woodland and was buried at Heber. My parents were married on May 6, 1860 in Faversham, Kent County, England. My oldest sister, Charlotte Isabel, was born in England. Before leaving for America with the Saints, they lived with Grandfather Potts. Widowed, he remained alone in England and was never seen by any of his Mormon posterity again in the flesh. He lived to be almost 81 years old and was killed by a late train while walking on a railroad track, having lost his hearing. About two weeks before my father died, in 1909, I went from Park City to Woodland, Utah to do some work, and I stopped at their home. As we sat down to supper, father said, Well, Will, your mother and I raised ten of you, and now here we are alone, all of you gone. Then he seemed to reflect and said, That's life, and it's right. My sisters and I and your Uncle George just walked out and left father alone. My parents and one-year-old sister Charlotte, together with my uncle George and Aunt Fanny, left England on the 6th of May, 1862, on the ship Manchester with Captain Henry Flask. They were six weeks crossing the ocean and landed in New York, then traveled by railroad to Florence, Nebraska, where they had to wait six weeks for the ox trains to take them west. This delay threw them late in starting over the plains. They joined with the Captain Ansel P. Harmony Company with 60 wagons. Then on the Sweetwater River in Wyoming Territory on September 18, 1862, my oldest brother Thomas Henry was born. A wagon in which mother was riding was filled with freight. When she was taken sick, they drove it to one side and father, a midwife, and one other man stopped. Soon after noon, the train went on, fearing being caught in the storm. About 4 p.m. it was over, so they started and drove till about midnight to overtake the train. Later, while making a night drive through Echo Canyon, their wet wagon was upset down a bank into the creek, putting my mother's ankle out of place and throwing the baby into the brush. 
He was not hurt, but two children in the wagon behind were drowned. So they bumped over the rocks and down into Salt Lake Valley, arriving October 6, 1862. They went out to Big Cottonwood briefly, where father's sister, Alice White, lived, where they had come the year before. Then they moved south to Salt Creek for a year and a half and returned to Cottonwood where my brother John was born. Then they moved to Hiram, Cache County, where they lived something over four years. This is where I was born on November 8, 1866, and my brother George was born in 1869. Only two things I remember about this place. My father making us whistles out of willow limbs by removing the bark and a pair of red top shoes I wore. My cousin, Aunt Harriet Wise's boy, had a new hatchet. He was hacking on a log upon which I was standing. He came closer and closer and closer and I didn't move, so he chopped through the shoe and almost through my right big toe. The scar is still mine. Then father built a rock house at Collingston near the Bear River Bridge on Hampton Stage Station. Here my sister Julia Jane was born. It was here my mother's brother lived, Henry George Jemmett. From Collingston we moved to a stage station about due west on the west side of the Bear River on the stage route from Corinne to Montana where my father worked as a clerk for the stage. Here we stayed until the route was changed by the railroad to the Hampton Bridge route. We then stayed one winter at Portage I remember this by the birds flying or running close ahead of us, and upon being told if we put salt on their tails, how we could catch them. I thrilled at this, and I went at it in all earnestness, and was convinced that I almost done it. At Portage, one thing happened that I distinctly recall. Saturday night, bath night, a chartered oak stove, hot, and a tub of water, and we undressed, waiting our turns, dancing around. I got pushed and landed on the edge of the stove. Results, a scar an inch wide, five inches long on my left middle. Good identification. The next spring my father took up a homestead about midway between what was Square Town and Hampton Station. This is now Fielding, where the sugar factory is, but the place is yet known as Potts Hollow. Here, as a boy, I saw the old Concord stage pass night and morning, and its six horses, the driver's long whip, its passengers inside, and sometimes on top, a picture that will never fade from my memory. We went swimming in the Malad River and a few times at the hot springs near the river. They were much like the hot pots at Midway, Utah, only larger, and one seemingly bottomless. At this time, Father went to work at the mines at Ophir, Tooele County. This kept him from home so much that I hardly got to know him. So Mother and Grandma were our teachers, and while I never knew or heard about schools, towns, or cities, or knew more than a dozen boys or girls, yet I learned to read and can remember some of the books we had. We seemed to be a happy group, kids, and who fished, strolled, milked cows, slept, growed and wore a few clothes, a hickory shirt and pants. I remember made from seamless sacks, barefooted most of the summer and free as the birds, whose nests we found and were taught to love. Grandma was kindness itself, never stepping on or killing anything she could avoid, telling us God made them all and loved all. I remember one of our lectures. When we got in a quarrelsome mood, she would stand up and say, shaking her finger at us, Dogs delight to bark and bite, for God has made them so. But your little hands were never made to tear each other's eyes. I never remember seeing those lines in print until about two months ago when I found them in a child's book of verses by an English author. Learned by the time I was seven, they've stuck and made some of my character. In the fall of 1874, when I was almost eight, we moved to Tooele, where father had a house built. You can guess what a gang of seven of us ran up against when we landed in town and a few days were sent off to school. Life was made quite miserable, to say the least. To the ways of boys, we were green as grass, and battles had to be fought on all sides, for we were strange bees in new hives. 
There, an older brother of one Newt Dunyon, a mining man of Utah, gave me candy to get me to smoke a cigar. I tried it. Then, when I got sick and wanted to quit, he said I couldn't have the candy unless I finished it. So I started all over. There was a sick boy. I could not go home, so he carried me to the barn and put me upstairs in the hay, where I was for about four hours, unable to get up, for every time I tried, the barn tipped over on me. I think I have forgiven him by this time, as good came from evil. That has been the extent of my smoking, and it was worth all that it cost. We children knew nothing about the Mormon church. I cannot think of ever hearing of it. My father at this time had left the church and held to the idea of letting children grow up and choose for themselves. Yet he chose to send us to the Methodist church. This I attended for some three years, and I have great respect for what I received there. My teacher, a young lady, instilled it into my very being a love for God, order in the church, and the need for prayer. I hope to someday meet her again, and with all my heart thank her for what she gave me. I cannot remember what she taught, yet I know much of my character has been formed by how she taught me. And looking back, I cannot think of any time that I didn't know there was a God, and no doubts have ever come into my heart to the opposite. My mother and grandmother taught me to pray, and this young lady gave me reasons why. So all my life has been centered upon these truths, these stepping stones by which we climb ever near towards the life perfected. I went to school for three years in Tooele. Then in October 1877, we moved to what is now Woodland, Summit County, Utah. This town was just a string of farms where we were snowed in for four to five months each year. A wonderful place in the summer to fish, hunt, and roam hills. I was 11 years old on November 8, 1877, and large for my age. We extracted happiness out of what we had. We made bows and arrows. There was no wire then as now, and we used several things as substitutes for arrow tips. Tin dish pans were then made with wire as a top edge. My brother George and I needed some very much. We then remembered where we had seen an old dish pan some three or four miles from home. So we walked there and got it, thus replenished our arrow stock and was made happy. We had a few traps for catching ground squirrels, of which there were many. Our only team was oxen, so to show how boys' minds work, we got the idea of yoking up a couple of squirrels. We made yokes and bows and tried it many times, but never succeeded, as we could not put them on tight enough to hold them without choking them. And thus a great industry passed away in its first recorded trials. Father read to us children considerable, he had an excellent voice and ability to imitate different dialects. I remember him reading about the Custer Massacre and describing it to us. When we arrived in Woodland, there was no school, church, or social life for several years. Place built up very slowly, very few new people moving in. Then an elderly couple by the name of Mr. and Mrs. Hans Larson gave their kitchen to hold Mormon Sunday School. They only had two rooms in their log house, and that small. We walked over a mile to their Sunday school, which continued through the summer. Then the people got together and put up a log house about 20 by 30 feet. This was our church and school for several years. In 1881, a ward was organized, and it was called Woodland. This has continued to this day. Our side of the Provo River was then known as Bench Creek. While there, my father ran an irrigation ditch over two miles to the Bridge Hollow Creek Ditch. We worked on this two years, and it was mostly done by hand. I learned the pick and shovel way quite early in life, and it has always helped me to help myself. We surely worked for all we got. I feel there were several years that I never had in money to exceed two dollars a year. Father always tried to furnish us with work at something, and to this day I wonder how they fed and clothed and kept us going. My father kept cows, and so it was necessary to put up hay. For several years this was cut with a scythe, and grain with a cradle, raked with a hand rake, and pitchforks to pile it up. There was one small sawmill, Thane's, 
Then others came, and at age 18 I went to work for Mr. Kidder in a sawmill at the South Fork of the Provo River, on the road that now runs to the Uinta Basin. In my twentieth year I bought a yoke of oxen and a logging wagon on credit. My father signed the note with me for something like five hundred and fifty dollars. I lived to pay up that note, even chopped ties, sawed logs, and worked on river drives two seasons on the Provo. Then I went to work on the Moulton's Ranch about three miles east of Park City, doing all kinds of farm work, and drove a milk wagon to Park City. Was there about a year, wages three months for one hundred dollars, board and room. Done quite a bit of butchering as they also furnished the Ontario mine, mill and tunnel with meat and milk. Once the Transcontinental Railroad was completed in 1869, many Chinese came to Park City to do service jobs. Local prejudice against them ran high. It was on this ranch job I made friends with the Chinese cooks by doing small favors for them, carried their mail and treated them as human beings. This paid dividends as at any time I could go into the kitchens and nothing they had was too good for me. Pies, cakes, fruits, tea, such tea, and all came my way. This was kept up by them as long as I lived in that place, for they never forgot a kindness. From there I went to the mines about a year, and then I took up work in Park City as a carpenter's helper, as I learned somewhat the use of tools. I worked that summer, then back to the mines for the winter. I went to the woodlands to spend the holidays. During this time, Father had sold his place on Bench Creek in 1889 to James Daly Van Tassel and had bought 40 acres from George Ellis on the river bottoms. When I went to the dance that night, I met Francis Amelia Van Tassel for the first time. I remember we danced twice that evening. Then I went back to the mines and worked till spring, when I again went home. I again met Francis, and a correspondence between us began. My dear Fanny, it is with great pleasure that I address these lines to you, hoping they will find you well as they leave me at present. It was pretty bad to have to start work again after resting so long. I very near gave out the first two days, but it comes natural to me now, I have got a little used to it. I felt as though I was about fifty and without a friend in the world, but I am glad to believe that I have many good and true friends that I can trust and depend on. For such is what I believe you to be, and I hope that I may prove worthy of your confidence and love. I hope that the day is not far distant when we will not have to part from each other, for then I believe we will be happy and enjoy ourselves. My heart beats true to you, and I believe it ever will. There is a theater here tonight. I wish you were here so we could go and see it. But, as it is, I thought I could pass the time better by writing you than going. I was going to write last night, but we had visitors that came after supper and did not go until bedtime. I have to get up at a quarter past five to get up to the mine to be ready to work by seven, so when the night comes I am ready to retire. So you see, I keep good hours and company, as I have not been away from home at night, I call this home now, since I left Woodland. Well, my dear, don't you stay home just because I do, but go and enjoy yourself whenever you can. And by doing so, you will please me, for I wish you to be happy. As I do not wish to run around myself, it is no reason you shouldn't. You must excuse my poor writing, and I will try and do better next time. Write soon, and believe me to be your true friend and love. William. Our correspondence lasted about six months. When I again went home to Woodland, our friendship had ripened to a point where it became necessary to have an understanding for at this time I was classed as an outsider and had experiences either in life where this had been broken perfectly good faith in me by parties listening to and accepting advice from others against me because they stated I was not a Mormon. I'd been baptized at age 16 and I think my record was a good average then for I did not drink or smoke and tried to be a man and thinking about it at this time present day, I feel I understood the religion of Jesus Christ better than many who criticized me for having a mind of my own, and being willing to follow only where conscious spoke. I did meet all kinds of characters, for the minds, like the net, caught all kinds. I had seen the effects of drinking and loose living, weighed them in the balance, and found them wanting. So when I again met Francis, I fully expected that this would be the end of our little romance. 
I didn't mince matters as we had a heart-to-heart -heart talk. I knew her honest desire was a temple marriage. This I couldn't promise, and stated I would not even hold out any hope for such a, as long as I was in my present mind, for I would not ask for a recommend unless I was fully assured that that was the better way to do. But if I ever did get a recommend, I would surely try to live to its requirements. I fully appreciated her position and didn't seek to lower her standards. The outcome of it was that we would continue our friendship and she would use her own judgment and make her own decision when the time came. I left her free to use her own agency at any and all times. The result was that at the end of two years we were married on December 21, 1891. We had built a neat three-room cottage in Woodland. We stayed at Van Tassel's place that winter. A sister Van needed Frances' help as a new son, Clyde, had come to them. In the spring, we moved into our own home, and not long after this, as I drank tea and Francis liked coffee, one morning, as we sat at the table, we entered into an agreement that I stopped tea and she her coffee. We shook hands over it, and I'm glad to relate that from that day to this, these things have never been used in our home. It seemed almost like a dream. All desire for it completely left, so much so that it has not even been wanted. We began to ask a blessing upon our food. Then it was not long until we knelt in prayer. We attended church regularly. I began to see more and more what it was all about, and Frances was a wise companion. She let me take my time and gently led me on without any force. Then, at the time the Salt Lake Temple was dedicated, a revival took place in all wards. People were asked to renew their covenants, so a baptism service was held in March. There was about 18 inches of snow on the ground, yet about a dozen of us broke trail to the Provo River and was baptized. We walked back nearly a half a mile and not one of us had any bad effects from it. Soon after this I was ordained a teacher. I took my beat and did what I could as a ward teacher. Francis attended the temple dedication, but I did not. We began to pay tithing, but it was not much, as little was made. We gave five dollars to the temple. In the fall of 1894, we were married in the temple, so all our children are under the covenant, as Earl was born on April 3, 1895 at Woodland. I went for two weeks to Provo in the interest of mutual MIA work. I saw and heard Carl G. Mazur speak several times. He had also been Francis's teacher in Salt Lake schools. Up to this time, I had been very nervous in trying to speak in public. I was in earnest in this duty. When I came back, there was quite a gathering to hear my report. It was then I learned to put my trust in God. I lost my fear and spoke the allotted time and all seemed to be pleased. I didn't forget to thank God, and from that time till now I have followed to a large extent that course and have found it as the only safe way to carry on. I worked with my brothers two winter seasons on a ditch about two miles long on a side hill. This is now quite a canal. I surveyed it all with a carpenter's level, and, I, and it proved fine. Times were hard, and I was to have had 20 acres, but in 1896 we decided to go to Park City for the summer. So I gave it all up and we started all over again. I finally sold our home for $100. That was less than the doors and windows and the rustic could cost. At Park City, under a bitter spirit of persecution, a small branch had been started. We started in and worked for 14 years in Sunday school, mutual, and ward duties. Here I met and made many dear friends, and the church became my school, for whatever small degree of success I have reached has come through this service. After our not yet completed meeting house was destroyed in the Park City's Great Fire of 1898, I was elected a trustee over the church property, deeds, and secretary of the building committee for the new church house. I received my patriarchal blessing in 1900 from John Smith, patriarch of the church, and it has been and is a comfort to me in carrying on. It was in Park City that Ray, Inez, Gladys, and Harold came to us as welcome guests, each with their sunshine. 
Here we learned to pay our tithing as we earned it. This has continued with us to this day, and I heartily endorse it. For what we have given, we have. What we kept, we have consumed. We have never wanted for bread or been without a roof over us, and this largely our own roof. In May 1902, I went on a mission to California. I left father, mother, brothers, and sisters, wife, and three small children to try and bring the gospel light to the hearts of others. I was at San Francisco, Oakland, San Jose, Watsonville, and Santa Cruz. All were small wards then. At Watsonville and Santa Cruz, no members at all. A new field where I labored for about five months. Now they are wards. Then people were leery of us and didn't hide their dislike. Yet we made friends and sowed many seeds that helped to break down prejudice. All this only helped me to see that what pearls of great price we had to give away and how few wanted them. Frances had by far the hardest mission, as she had only her hands and God to look to in feeding the family and running the house. This she done so well that she even sent me some money, paid tithing, and ran no debts, and did not complain at her lot but put her whole heart into it. Then four-year-old Inez died with diphtheria. I left for home, but she was buried the day before I arrived. I bear testimony that there was no feeling of death in our home. A quiet spirit filled our hearts and took away its sting. We didn't feel we had been dealt with unjustly, for we felt then, as we do now, there is no end to this life. It goes on and on, and we have not lost her, as she is at home with him who gave her life to her. We only organized her body, and that as a seed awaits its own time to come forth. So after death we will again be complete, both soul and body. And as long as they are separated, a fullness of joy cannot come. Hence the need for resurrection, which will come to all, yet will not mean the same to all at its coming. When I got home, I found my wife almost at a breakdown, as her source of living had fallen almost to nothing. We had taken borders from the sample mill, and the ore from the mines had dropped off until only two had continued. So I wrote President Robinson and explained the situation, and he sent me an honorable release. Two weeks later, on August 31, 1903, I took our son Earl to Silver Creek and baptized him, as we had no font at Park City. When I went to see our bishop, Fred Rasband, to talk things over, he said, Brother Potts, I called the priesthood together and told them I thought it right to ask them to clear all expenses of the funeral. So responsive was the call that many not of our faith came to him, giving him money. So much so, he had a paid-up receipt for the grave lot and all the other expenses, with no list as to who were the donors. This left me then, and still remains with me, that I am the debtor unto all people, and in this spirit I have tried to work. The chance came to me to partly repay when Brother Bergy lost a small boy there and I had him bury him in that lot. I have looked upon my mission as not being for months or years, but for life here in eternity. So I took up the church work at home just as I left it, worked as a teacher and with the presiding elder as ward clerk. In fact, I had and performed more duties by far than I did on my mission, for the work there was only missionary work and a strong bond of friendship grew between us, that though we have scattered and many have passed away, yet that circle has never, nor can be, broken. And it's my full idea of heaven to take up work and go hand in hand with those I have met, loved, and labored for and with. And this spirit has followed me through all my time to the present day, and it's that spirit I have ever hoped to cultivate and increase. I was ordained to 70 when I left for my first mission to California. After being home a while, I was ordained a high priest in 1906 and performed one marriage ceremony at Park City. We made several trips to the temple as our ward grew up, and I received great spiritual blessings from there, even an assurance of eternal life that reaches beyond faith to perfect assurance, peace, growth, love for fellow man, and an honest desire for service in the church and kingdom of God our Father. 
I've been a consistent churchgoer most all of my life, and it has brought me many chances to see and note that spiritual values endure and enrich the lives of all who cultivate them. I've seen the sick healed, lives made over for good by doing deeds of light and turning away from darkness and sin. I've seen lives wrecked by turning away from the gospel and seeking earth's values for themselves. With it went peace of mind and brought darkness of spirit in its place. I have felt the power of God to that extent that I have walked almost without effort, received strength of body and mind, and felt every part of my being filled with joy beyond what man can give. We passed through several depressions while at Park City, yet we always had food and shelter and always friends. Our lives seemed to run in cycles of 14 years for we gave our contribution there in Park City for that time. Each of us giving ourselves to duties has ever brought rich memories and added pages of consistent work well done. Tithing paid each time and in its season as we earned it. We have ever paid it with an assurance that it's truly God's law to us, and it will ever stand to our credit, for each life is separate, and we do not draw from each other's accounts, nor do thieves break in and steal or time dim. I spent about three months on Duck Creek near McGill, Nevada doing assessment work on mining claims, all alone except for Moses W. Taylor. I also spent two months in Idaho on Little Lost River. These two jobs and the sale of stock I had cleared our indebtedness on our last Park City home. It cost us over a thousand dollars and after leaving it and going to Silver City, Utah, we sold it for 200 It was in this home that our son Harold came to us, whose coming almost took the life of his mother, whom I believe was only granted a stay of life through the power of the priesthood. In 1910, we moved to Silver City, Juad County, Utah, where I worked as a mine carpenter and we started in to build up a new ward. There we passed through about all the duties that came to individuals as we had been consistent church workers. We went to the Manti Temple several times, also to Salt Lake. Our children grew up strong and healthy. We ever knelt in prayer and gave thanks for food, life, and labor. In 1914, I went on a short-term mission to Southern California. I was at Long Beach and San Pedro mostly, both new fields. One night I dreamed our Bishop John Smith and wife came to see me and gave me an overcoat. As I sat studying that morning, a knock came to the door. I answered it, and there stood our bishop and his wife. We had a very pleasant visit, and when they left, he said, Brother Potts, I was away when you came out here, so now I want to help you. He gave me ten dollars. Not a bad dream. I had not heard that they were in the state. A sister and three other persons wanted to visit the World's Fair at San Diego. To go in safety, she asked me to go with them, and she felt they all would be safer. This I done, and the visit was pleasant. At the close of this mission, Francis came to California, and we had the most pleasant visits and sightseeing two weeks we ever spent together. We visited the fair at San Francisco for three days, and then returned to Silver City. Then came the War of 1915. Earl was married and had one baby, and expecting another yet he filed no exemption papers and went into the service and was assigned to the 91st Division, 364th Machine Gun Battalion. Ray volunteered in the Navy service and was sent into the electric service, became an ensign and went overseas as an officer with a transport of men to France and was there when the armistice was signed. After having served as a patriarch in the Nebo stake, I was called as the stake patriarch of the new Tintic stake in Eureka in 1917. Francis, as a stake officer in the Relief Society, worked almost night and day on supplies for the government and clothing for the homeless. And this, and through worry over our boys, she sapped her strength. She went to conference at Salt Lake, visited many of her old school friends and her folks at Riverton where she was taken sick and remained there three days. Then, by sheer strength of will, she took the train home, and the next day seemed to be better and cheerful. But she became worse again. We had a lady nurse and a doctor. This was the great flu year, and her trouble was pronounced flu. 
This continued for about a month, and she took a turn for the worse, and on November 4, 1918, she passed away. To travel, one had to wear a flu mask, so we left for Riverton, where on November 8, 1918, my birthday, we laid her mortal remains away, there to await the touch of the Master's hand to again reunite both body and spirit in a, an eternal life of glorious opportunity. As I said, my life has seemed to run in cycles of 14-year periods. As near as I can tell, I was at Woodland 14 years, then at Park City the same, then at Silver City likewise, and here in Walnut Creek, California, I have surpassed that period. At each of these places is a distinct record, seemingly closed as I left and a new one began. For years I had been a consistent tithe payer, and at this time the truth of this principle appeals as absolutely divine. It has done much in molding my character. Its promises have been fully realized, for the bread cast on the waters has ever came back, and it will be there as a memorial for none else can receive it but us. It's our eternal bank account. In 1903, I was the first Mormon missionary to introduce the gospel truths to Lara E. King of Oakland, California. I made a number of calls and then was sent to San Jose. Other elders took up the work with the result that she was baptized. We corresponded for a number of years. Then her home was broken up and her daughter Grace was married. Then they went from here to Ephraim where she taught school one term, then to Bountiful. From there, Lara came to the Salt Lake Temple, and I and your mother went in and all went through the temple together, and Lara got her endowments. They stayed in Utah about two years, then moved back to California. On February 4, 1920, Lara and I were married and lived in Silver City about three and one half years. The work of the smelter had shut down, and work was scarce. So in September 1923, we came to California, Lara's health was poor in the high altitude. We stayed that winter at Lafayette. Then we bought our lot here in Walnut Creek and moved into a house just across the street. I set out trees and grapes and laid our foundation for a house that summer. The next year I built the house almost on overtime, night and morning. There were none of our LDS people here for a year or two and we only got to a few conferences in Oakland yet no Sunday work went on our house, and at the end of the next year we moved into it. My faith is that, had we worked Sundays, this would not have been. Then a few families were found and a Sunday school organized in which I was appointed teacher in the parents' class. For some eight years we continued and became outstanding in our work of efficiency in orderly classes, winning the stake banner twice by contests. New people were brought in and were baptized and are faithful workers today, ever rejoicing in the training and teaching they received here in this little ward. During this time, I can recall being absent only twice, and then I visited other schools upon invitation. A strong tie of friendship was attained, and though we are scattered, we have not forgotten each other, and we have many come from long distances to see us. 476 in 1940, and in 1941, 496 came. So we are not alone very long at a time, and it's ever the gospel that takes the lead in our conversations. A letter from my Corn Presidency reads, Our thoughts have wandered over the hills many times into that pleasant little valley through which many, many good people have beaten a path to a humble cottage on a secluded street where a man of mighty faith sojourns. Indeed, Walnut Creek has received much consideration from its most distinguished resident, that gray-haired, lovable patriarch, William E. Potts. From far and near they have come to this shrine to worship, to counsel, to seek strength, to penetrate fog banks of doubt and uncertainty, to receive renewed faith, be fed with rich spiritual food. They have come to rejoice, to bless, and be blessed. They have departed praising God and expressing a deep appreciation for their beloved leader. And we hope to keep the good work going as we can. We enjoy the faith and confidence of the church authorities and members. In all wards I have friends beyond counting. 
My patriarchal blessing charges me with the duty to teach and to exhort the saints to faithfulness. I have spoken at quite a number of meetings, conferences, and funerals, at which I have been given a flow of words beyond my natural ability. For this I give all praise to the Father of us all, for his priesthood and his, its eternal powers. I have married five couples, baptized about 15, and have given 153 patriarchal blessings here. We own our own home and am free from debts and still a working man. And through the church has come my greatest opportunities for self-education, for spiritual powers excel all others. By giving us visions of true values concerning our families, life's duties, and a sense of service about self and earthly riches. Where I live matters not as long as I am in the service of the Master. I recommend the reading of Mosiah, second chapter, to confirm that. When we are in the service of our fellow beings, we are only in the service of our God. Our friends are legion here in the Oakland Stake, and greater opportunities for spiritual growth have been given me as a church worker and stake patriarch here, all of which makes me very humble indeed, and shows me how dependent I am on the giver of all good for true riches. True riches does not consist of silver and gold, but friendship and eternal life with eternal progression under eternal laws of justice and equity. So may we ever follow the true beacon of life, for it grows brighter with each passing year, and it is true, and changes not in its onward course. I have tasted sorrow's cup, and have met joys face to face. Earl died in 1940 at age 45 at the Veterans Hospital in Livermore, California, leaving seven orphan children. I went back to Utah with his body. He and Harold were very active in temple work. Harold had done for all our family that had not been done. The next day after Earl was buried, Harold and I went through the Salt Lake Temple, and there I saw my wife Frances. Earl's mother, after we had been separated over 22 years, she was in full possession of perfect womanhood and filled with life and power to walk seemingly without effort and rapidly, exact in size, step, and motion that I knew so well, yet I thought she was someone else, as her veil was down until I stepped out to speak with her and find out who it was that resembled my wife so. Then she raised the veil, and it was Frances. She didn't speak, only with her eyes and a smile of happiness and perfect health. So I have seen with my eyes that life eternal is no myth or fable, but a fact which I have always believed and preached and expect to continue to do so. My second wife, Lara King Potts, died in 1942, but so it goes. The reaper catches us all in our time and turn, and it's all okay with me for our bodies are only a temporary arrangement to fill mortal life. But when we receive them again, as we will, then they will be as our spirits now are, eternal. So we must look up and live each day as best we can. These aches and pains, tired limbs and unsteady legs will all be left behind and joys everlasting will be ours. There is always something new ahead to gain and enjoy which will be open to all who have been faithful over even one talent. I know God lives and is our Father, that Joseph Smith was and is a prophet, and that he mingles with God's planning for his brethren and the completed kingdom of which we are members. I know that this is the dispensation of the fullness of times. Though we are scattered now as a family, we shall all be gathered again in a family circle. I am proud of our children, one and all, and my fondest wish is that no link shall ever be broken. Death cannot separate us, only our own willful wills can do that, and I have faith that this will never occur. And in the spirit of humility, I hope to carry on and on, not only in this life, but through ages of eternity that will ever be before us, with ever more powers and wisdom to handle those powers in constructive unison to bless all with selfishness forever barred by walking hand in hand with light and truth. I know this, that the best lies ahead. Our Redeemer lives, and we shall not want the groveling things of this life, Quickened by his spirit, we will seek as he sought the will of the Father above all else. 
and there shall flow through our souls intelligence supreme, which always brings dividends and never leaves a heavy heart, but stamps its power upon our characters and reflects it through our eyes. My hopes for the future days allotted me here is to build upon the foundation of the Church of Jesus Christ as set up by the prophet Joseph Smith. If I do that, there will not come to me burdens too great to bear if I put my trust in God and not in the strength of man or in his kingdoms that are destined to pass away, for the earth's sanctification will not leave room for them. I thank God for his tender care over me and mine, which all who will come unto him may enjoy, trusting my all to his tender care. I bid all seek him and know true peace and joy. P.S. Following Lara's death, William Edwards Potts traveled to Southern California to visit his daughter Gladys and her family, then journeyed to Salt Lake City to visit Ray and Harold and families and attend the April General Conference of 1943. Shortly afterward, he contracted pneumonia and was hospitalized in the LDS Hospital and passed away on May 5, 1943. Church Patriarch Joseph Fielding Smith spoke at his funeral. Many letters of sympathy, praise, and love were received by the family from those whose lives he had touched. He was buried next to his beloved Francis in the Riverton Cemetery.